Welcome to Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I'll be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasaw native, your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we have got a treat. The Berserker, the Barbarian, the 1985 PWI Rookie of the Year. Tag team with Stan Hansen, Bruiser Brody, and almost impelled The Undertaker. He is Mr. John Nord. John, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a lot for having me, you guys. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I was just uh, telling Justin, I said, man, there's there's uh, questions I want to ask these guys from 50 years, man. <laughs> well, you know, that that's remarkable that, that we've never crossed paths. You know, we've both been in the business. All three of us have been in the business forever. But uh, sometimes yeah. in, in this business, you know, it just doesn't happen. But where we're finally getting to hook up with each other, we all three have so much in common. So this should be a wonderful conversation. John, would we like Bring to get started? On. We'd like to get started here. The way, way, way we usually get started is, Tell us a little bit uh, about the John Nord, you know, that, that grew up being an athlete and, you know, I and professional wrestling and especially that group of guys that you came up with, man, what a phenomenal group, a hall of fame in any, anybody's book. So tell us a little bit about John Nord as a kid. And I know you're an athlete, you're playing football, you're a wrestler, track and field. You, you set record for just about every sport that you, you participated in bodybuilding, uh, uh, all that stuff. So tell us a little bit about John Nord when he's growing up. Well, grow thanks for asking. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I grew up in a large family. We had uh, uh, 11 kids, and uh, we were just at uh, it come, you know, really, I just, I always like to mention it, but we come from, you know, my grandpa and grandmas were farmers, and my great-grandpa was around till I was in eighth grade. And he was in World War One, and they they all come from Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, proud of it, love Sweden. You know, you got girls like Anne Margaret, and you know a lot of hotties are from from Stockholm. So I like to uh, mention that. But anyways, yeah, grew up in that north uh, north northern suburbs of Minneapolis, and grew up with. Uh, I mean, literally right in the same neighborhood, uh, Kurt Hanning, Rick Rude, uh, uh, Mike Hegstrand, Hawk, uh, uh, myself, Barry Darso, uh, Tom Zink was very close, and there's always Fort Scott Simpson. I mean, and these are all guys that we went to the same high school, except Hawk. He was next. But anyway, so we were... Uh, at, uh, we we love sports, and uh, boy, I think by age fifteen we were uh, all we could do was wait for Friday nights after the football game and see how see how much beer we can put down. <laughs> Back then, when it wasn't, you know, they just turned their head and rolled their eyes and said, "Well, <laughs> it's okay as long as nothing bad happens." Yeah. And thankfully, nothing did in high school and. I can tell you this, growing up with them guys and 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 my own family, I could not have grown up with more better, more loving, more uh more uh just just good people that uh uh you know it was in the years you could go over and you know to their doorstep and you didn't even, half the time you didn't even knock, you just screamed, I'm coming in here, you know, and uh it was great years, and it, it was it, it would be too much to talk about. But yeah, and I love football. I always wanted to be a pro football player. That was my dream my whole life. And uh, and uh, I got in a cup of coffee in the USFL, and with the New Jersey Generals, and uh, uh, I got. Uh, I also, I mean, we watched the AWA growing up. Uh, people in this area. We were hardcore AWA guys. Well, wait, like, wait, with Henning as a friend, you had to watch his, his old man there and, and the AWA. Yeah, that also, right? We did, we did. So when the axe was on TV, we'd be like, we'd see him, you know, coming to the wrestling matches at the high school or whatever. Now, did, did you see him around the neighborhood? Larry, Larry, he's a guy that if you see, you're going to no, you oh saw God, <laughs> do you think so? Holy smokes. No, he was at his biggest. He was one of the most, the, the, the strongest, 
strikingly huge human he was being. he was intimidating to, to be around for me he was. was very intimidating and uh of course kurt on the other side he was you couldn't you had a more he was the mouth of the south i mean he was <laughs> your gold figure man. <laughs> oh yeah i go figure you know and uh and anyways uh and and rick rude's dad was a, a super big tough kind of guy uh uh they owned a called rude's lowry pub so they had a bar little three two joint that uh we used to go in when we were teenagers and just kind of stuff around see what we could kind of trouble we could get into but we never did we never did at, at in our teen years we we fared pretty good staying out of trouble but i'll tell you it's uh, uh the stories and and the people i i just could not have could not have grown up in a greater place with with better people and uh and pretty girls for that matter you know <laughs> so what, um what happened john with uh, so many guys all became wrestlers i mean i understand the association with uh, kurt and his and his dad axe and being there around Vern. but what happened that so many of these guys not only became wrestlers but hall of fame wrestlers i mean that that class you come out that you came out with it's insane the number of people that made it to the top in this business out of that one high school. Yeah, that, yeah, no, Bradshaw. I, uh, I, I'm like, uh, we, we kind of say, well, uh, everybody said, well, something in that water, but we really did. It was Vern Gagne graduating from Robbinsdale High School in 1943. Wow. That was the pinnacle pinpoint moment of everything um the war was on uh with 1943 Vern was you know state champ kid from robbinsdale my actually the gal that i was married to, to for 25 years was Vern's best man at his wedding and they grew up together as kids and go figure during brad Raymond's wrestling camp um i i i didn't even think of saying anything you know but i got through with brad's camp and and it took 30 days five weeks maybe and Vern came by at the end to come by and so-called smarten us up and i says i think you might know my father-in-law i says he goes what well, you know he's wondering if i'm bs i says joe elson he goes well hold it now not joe. how do you spell it? you know you know burn right away he's being kind of uh doubting i said no it's the guy you grew up with what you're joe elson's son-in-law oh my god they're salt of the earth people you treat that girl good he says <laughs> and, and i'm like i'm but i never thought one thing of ever thinking well that's what i'll use to try to get me further in this business because i didn't even know i didn't know even know about the how the business worked i was i was i just didn't and uh but that was the point. We've seen Vern Gagne, uh, you know, advertising his, what, Geritol or something? <laughs> what did he sell? I don't know. But we've seen that on Sunday mornings. And I've got to say, Crusher was the, an icon. I mean, when you talk AWA, you probably think Crusher before anybody. But there we would be. The first year that kind of hit us was about seventh grade. When Kurt came back, he showed up at our locker in the junior high and he says, Nord, come here. He says, guess who I went up to Duluth with yesterday? And I says, no, who? He goes, Billy Thupita Graham, baby. <laughs> and I said, you did? Oh my God, what did he say? And right away we started imitating him, thinking we were good. Uh, yeah. But he'd go, Billy Graham looks best on him. Uh, May West looks best on Super's uh, Billy Graham's chest, and we just went over the edge laughing because that's what you do when you're in junior high. You laugh, you know. And boy, we just loved it. Uh, and that, but back to how it started, Bradshaw. It was it was just uh, certain guys were, I guess, a little tighter. Uh, 
Uh, Mike Hegstrand and Scott Norton, they were at the high school right next to us, but they hung around anyways. I mean, we're in the same neighborhood. And then we all started figuring out who was going to be taller. And uh, one day I, I all of a sudden was six, five and, and I was, you know, in, I think I grew six inches my junior year or so. And then, uh, and then we started lifting weights. And that, there was a place called the gym <laughs> and a guy named Jim Younger. It was the beginning of all the weightlifting and us guys going, uh, man, I love lifting weights. I love it. Hey, John, uh, hey, John let me kick up. What, what year was that? Because I got to work out at the gym when I was up there training for Brad. I mean, that, place, that just, place is awesome. That, wasn't that awesome? Oh, um, my God. Oh, it was just great. The first year, um, well, we started welding benches in 10th grade together. But Jimmy, the owner, was... Oh, I want to say 79 was the first year, 80. But then once he needed some money and he asked Mike and Joe, the road warriors, to kick in on some dough. And uh, he asked he asked about 25 people and about 15 of them came up with money for him to, you know, get the latest equipment and put their name and uh, up on you know, the wall and try to advertise it. Of course, this is all pre-internet, so I don't even know how to explain the money deal, but um, yeah, it was. And uh, he hung in there. Well, next thing you know, the gym was a place, if the old lady kicked you out, you went to the gym and slept. You know, if if uh, if uh, you want to know what's going on and nobody's answered their phone or they don't answer or they're just not, around you go to the gym to figure out what's going on. or where does the party begin the gym or i gotta say you know a credit to uh jesse ventura he had a gym uh at the same time the the gym was and the first year there was uh his first year actually was 77 because i worked for him right out of high school in 77 and and uh, paid me 200 a week cash, and I thought I was in seventh heaven. So I did the teenage bodybuilding deal. And I remember Joe Weeder. Do you remember Weeder? Right. Sure. Joe Weeder. Absolutely. He, he had all the big top bodybuilders, Arnold and Louie and uh, Franco Colombo. And I was in Mr. Teenage Minnesota back when it, they actually had stuff like that. And, and, uh, they seen that hey, there's this kid six five, uh, two thirty, and he's he looks like Louie or something, you know. And so they he actually tried to recruit me, but it wasn't my deal. I wanted to be a pro football player, you know, and not like I turned down a contract or, or nothing. I did, but he did call me, and uh, I remember talking to him, but. Back to the gym, Branch. I hope I answered that question. I don't oh, know. Oh, you no. did. I was there when I trained with Brad, uh, Hobby 55. You know, Brad was up in, I guess, Hamilton. He told me you you went to the gym with him. He I, did, I did yes. I, and uh, you go in there, it's, it's like the Mecca. You know, it's like uh, the Gold's Gym out in, in uh, Venice Beach. It's, it's a Mecca. And they had yeah. all the guys who bench press currently over 500 pounds, and this was 91. And was that it was 91? like 17 guys. You're looking at them, oh, my God. <laughs> it's unbelievable. It is, it is, and I think he ended up with over fifty, over fifty or five hundred guys. I don't know. I just talked to him a couple of days ago that were over five hundred pounds. It's just incredible, but it's gone with the wind, and it's hard picking up the little dust specks of stories that you can t still tell. So I'm, I'm just grateful to you guys that were actually still got guys here that will listen to a conversation <laughs> so thanks you guys thank you oh thank you I, i've been looking forward to this did brad ryan still have the tree then to train people when i was there he had like that a log? tree trunk oh god you remember that dang thing oh you i know, hated oh, it I, I don't i don't know if he does but you know he still owns that house and brad of course he lives in fargo he, he just has renter but he had the tree when you were training Oh hell yes. Yeah, I was actually so tell, tell us tell, tell us about the tree. I don't know anything about it. It's a it's a tree stump with no bark on it, and it's about six feet high. 
and it's got a few stubs and then it's varnished, you know. Right. So, uh, but it's heavy as hell. And Brad, the you know, the first day of, of camp, he's he's going like, and then and then they also have this gray dummy that weighed a couple hundred pounds. At, yes. yeah. You know, when you want to do these, you know, uh, you know, uh, side suplex or belly to right. black, me and Brad call it a belly to Blackwell suplex <laughs> because he, he, he belly to back Jerry Blackwell once and Jerry didn't even <laughs> give him any help, you know? So we always gave Brad a hard time about that. But, and then that damn log, you, he had a suplex in it. I'm like going, I got long legs. I do not suplex, Brad. You got short legs. You suplex well. And then right away, I was just giving it to him, you know, like, but, oh, yeah, it was a lot. Of, I got to say that camp, which was a, technically Brad's first one. And then, of course, Eddie Sharkey, Eddie had his hand in. He was out. God, what a, God, what a great bunch of guys guys we got yeah. God. you know eddie's such a con man you know <laughs> he's funny as hell but it was and 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 with, with no ego implied and all there's a lot of guys that would have never made it through that camp the thing with that no tree jerry way. was you suplexed it just over and over and over so you had this right. massive tree six foot tall this uh. huge tree and he suplex it one way then you suplex it the other Hold uh, on, was, head, it, then you was it made out of plastic did you what say it was made out of plastic? The tree? Was it? Yeah. No, no, no. I didn't feel oh, I it. I but you oh, remember no, no, no. It was a, it was, no, no I don't know. Like I described, right? Yeah, hey, no, no. It was this massive. I said massive, not plastic. Massive. Oh, <laughs> massive. Okay, I'm sorry. Massive well, anyway, tree. Yeah, it could have been hardcore plastic. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, you could right. barely get your hand, arms it. around I, it, Jerry. And you had to suplex this wooden thing all wow. over the place for conditioning. Uh, uh, so you had to yeah. turn it around. You had to do this. <laughs> Uh, All I wanted to learn was the iron claw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Oh, yeah. God, you nailed it. I haven't even thought about that damn thing for 30 Oh, I years. hated that tree. <laughs> oh, I hated that tree. <laughs> yeah. so, 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 John, you ended up going, uh, you're chasing your dream to play professional football. You, you, of course, you wrestled in, in high school, right? And then you played football. And you got a scholarship to Northern Iowa. I'm sure there was other. My, I got a I got a scholarship to Montana State. Montana State, okay. Right, yeah, cool. it's uh, and we actually had a wrestling team uh, yeah. there, uh, NC uh, Division One AA. But I definitely wasn't a good amateur wrestler. But I'll tell you, when I was out playing football there, uh, I was the football player that could beat the heavyweight because right. um, I had some background in high school and all this and that. And anyway, so I did get. Uh, 15 matches in my senior year so it was kind of fun I got all caught up on it it was it, it would have been 1982 uh -huh. um, so you know you got Steve Williams in the tournament right and I, I didn't go to the tournament um, you had to place first or second in the big sky and uh, uh, I just remember the guy I got beat by was a guy named Arnie Bagley and Arnie was ended up still a great football coach for Idaho. Yeah, big big black guy, do good dude. Oh, well, these stories. I don't even know which way to go, Jerry. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you're playing football there? Were you drafted uh, into the NFL, or do you? Uh, no, I'll tell you what. My senior year, my senior year, the summer before my senior year, we're all out drinking downtown Robbinsdale. Uh -huh. Here we go. Uh -huh. And uh, we're tussling around out. I break my ankle on the curb uh, outside a bar. And uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you, what do, you do? You kick somebody or you twist no, your ankle? Uh, we were, no, actually, what it was, it was a, it was a police sign saying, <laughs> do not do this or something. It wasn't just a park. So a buddy of ours, yeah, I wasn't a wrestler, but he was a football player, played for the Dolphins for seven years, and we're seeing who could touch that sucker the highest. I'm like, oh, you can't jump higher than me. No, 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 all that shit, you know. Uh -huh. And sure enough, I go up, 
tag it, come down, break my ankle. So, <laughs> yeah, so, and then I got to show up my senior. I mean, this is, as a young athlete, you guys know how traumatic these injuries right. are. And, and stuff anywhere from breaking your ankle to nerve damage. Like, why is my left tricep going? What's going on? Why is this happening? You know, I want to play pro football or I want to be the man, you know, however you were thinking back then. And uh, so anyways, my senior year, uh, I, sh I show up with a broke ankle. I do play the last four games and I do get uh, offered a deal for the Giants and because they, they had seen film on me in my junior year. What, so, what are you, what are you doing? You're six foot five, what, 285? Six five, 270, 275. Yeah. yeah, but I had a, I knew, that, you know how you, you, you guys can pick up on this. I know you know what I'm talking about. I knew I wasn't going to run a 4940, a 4A. At, and actually, I, I might have been, you know, I'd get up to 300 re, real easy, but um, I knew I wasn't going to, so I was always running that 5240, which was very presentable to the pros. That was nothing wrong with a 5240, unless you're bullshitting everybody <laughs> then uh -huh. and telling everybody you're running four, four six, which you can smell that out real quick, just by watching how a guy walks, you know. So, anyways, but I had a 500 bench. And back then you know, that was big news. And uh I think Steve Williams was the only guy that had a better bench than me. But a guy named Tom Bresnahan was the old line coach for the Giants, and it was Bill Parcells' first year. I fly out to the Giants. I do a two-week mini camp, and, and it actually lasts three and a half weeks. But at the end of my second week, Bill Parcells calls me in his office, and he says, yeah, John, we, we got a problem. I says, what's that? And he says, I, I just thought I was getting cut, you know. <laughs> and he says, your left knee is deformed. It did not pass the physical. And I knew it was too, you know. I, I, I always had trouble with that. And I just had had a scope and uh, uh Long story short, he says, but don't worry, I got a job for you. I says, what's that? He says, the New Jersey Generals. So a guy named Chuck Fairbanks was a head coach for the New Jersey Generals. They were practicing in Giant Stadium. So I got a job there the next day. And all this was <laughs> happening. And, and I'm scared as hell, too. You know, I just think I'm going to come home cut. You know, my leg, you know, everybody thinks when you're out at these teams like that in them years like oh big john's just gonna make it like no man i couldn't be cut are you kidding me i just want to make the team you know so i'll i'll just close it with this and i'll try to make this really short new jersey generals who do i run into there steve williams <laughs> well doc why well i was imitating doc you know back then but uh, and then I ran into him at Mid South, and uh, we had a few crazy party nights with the generals. And it seemed like me and Doc were always the guys that were kind of ahead of everybody on how crazy we were getting. Now you, you and Doc had a, had a friendship through uh, college wrestling, then, right? Is that how you, you not received? college wrestling? No, no. not college no. wrestling because I never ran into him at college okay. wrestling. Although. Uh, you know, if I would, I would have got pinned. So I, that was an easy. <laughs> well, Joe joined the club. Everybody else did too. <laughs> yeah. Well, all I wanted to go up by was this: was we're practicing one day for the generals, and we're going live. And there was a guy on the team named Greg Murtha from Minnesota, who was a good NFL lineman. You know, he played for the Eagles, and and uh, Doc was a real rebel. I mean, picture Doc in that <laughs> uniform. No, here's a guy with a gut, uh, like a beer gut, but he's got veins in his legs. Now, how does that work? You know, so uh, Doc, I see him in Mid South Wrestling. He says, "Hey, man, do you believe what they did to me, man?" I says, "Yeah, I remember, Doc. 
what had happened, we were going live, he came down on this Greg Murtha's knee and blew it out at practice, and, he's, and Greg Murtha started screaming, you son of a bitch, you tried to do that, you tried to do that, and this guy was serious, man, everybody's like, I mean, I was like, whoa, you just a moment, you don't forget, well, the next day they cut Doc. Wow. The next day. So sure enough, fast forward two years, there I am sitting in the uh, Mid-South Wrestling Locker Room in Shreveport, Louisiana. Jake Roberts just shaved my head. I'm the barbarian now. And uh, Vern sent me down to get some experience. And, and Doc came right up. And that's what he said. Hey, man, you believe what they did to me, man. <laughs> what a guy, Steve yeah. Williams. Steve, awesome that. guy. Yeah. Classic. So, so how, was, how, many, how many games did you get with the general? Did you get any games or what? I got, uh, well, I don't, you know what? I never started a game, but I did get special teams, uh, some special team stuff. And mine was, I he just, Parcells just flipped me in there as part of my deal. Oh, uh -huh. he didn't. He felt bad about telling me about his knee, about my knee. But so I got a job. But now they're in the. They're only one fourth in the way to their year. The generals. So all of a sudden, here comes this guy with, uh, you know, that's for an old lineman. I guess you could say he had a build like a bodybuilder. Uh -huh. uh, who the hell does he think he is here? He's just going to come in and get a job with us. So, Fuck him, you know, and all this, and I felt that tension. Wow. So man, I'm beating guys off uh -huh. me, and I'm and I'm punching guys through face masks, and the linebackers are going, "Come on, fresh legs! Come uh -huh. on, fresh legs!" And I'm going, "Fresh legs, man! You got, <laughs> you know." Um, but they had, and then once the guys figured out who I was and where I was coming from, well, then then it was easy. It was fun. Everybody wanted to be my friend, you know, but it's a hard deal you to come into if you think of that. It's kind of like going into a pro wrestling locker room and all of a sudden uh, you're, you know, oh, who is this guy? Geez, oh, he's, he's big, he's built. What are they, what are they going to do with him, man? Is yeah. he going to be main event tonight? What they, yeah. who's he think he is? He ain't getting my spot. Yeah. <laughs> It's same in every ever locker room, probably basketball, baseball. Always, always. guys are yeah. just. It can't help. It's called a young man's yeah. disease, yeah. and it, it really is, ain't it? Yes, it so, is. So was, uh, was Herschel was Herschel Walker with the Generals? Yeah, that was our big dude, man. And and getting to know Hersh, and, and I did. He made more money than the whole rest of the team put together. <laughs> and he, that, was, he, that was that was Donald he, Trump, right? No, the first year, a guy named Walter Duncan and owned the Generals. But Trump was in there fishing around, and he was still a famous guy. But I remember seeing him in there the first year. And uh, and uh, uh, wondering, why is he there? Because you never see Walter Duncan. You just heard that he was an old oil guy. I said, oil, boy, oil. That's where the money is, oil, boy. You know? <laughs> so he was one of them kind of guys. But Herschel had a stool, and you figure what the locker rooms are now, but we just had a little stool. It was a beautiful locker room compared to a high school, but now their high schools are way nicer. And I would go up, and, man, it would be Wednesday, or was it Thursday, and you had that gap you got a day to go drink you know we could hit that we could hit lawrence taylor's uh lawrence taylor's sports club and, and they had us the good deal i i had was they were paying for me at the sheridan inn in hasbrook heights and so my hotel and food were free as part of the deal and then they paid me forty two thousand five hundred, and i thought i hit the water you know <laughs> I thought, man, this is, I'm in the money. But you didn't think of money back then. You know, you guys know that. You, not really, money was way over here. But all I was getting to was Herschel. Herschel's uh, called me the beer man. He said, hey, beer man, you going for it tonight? It's that time, ain't it? I said, yep. And he had his uh, 
wife out there. He was married then, you know, and she was a she was a real athletic track star from Georgia. Right, right. And uh, anyways, back then, uh, yeah, Herschel Walker didn't was still, and he he's, was the nicest guy. The, he was the real deal, man. He really, he came up to me and said, man, you, you are you short of some cash? I says, no, man, I got a lot of money. I'm making 42500 <laughs> Hell no, Hurst, I'm good. But, you know, just to see this guy, you know, Bo Jackson gets all the accolades, and he should. He was a freak of freaks. But I'll tell you what, everybody since uh, they claim he didn't have this great career as a pro. He had a really good career as a pro. But to see him the year he won the Heisman, you guys, to see him run in college, to see them highlights, you talk about a freak. He's right there with Bo, Hirsch, or Earl Campbell, on and on. You know, yeah, and you but know, he man. was a freak, man. And it might be that he was like Warren Moon a lot. You know, Warren Moon played up in Can Canadian Football League so yeah. much. You Love missed Warren. a lot of Warren Moon's great years. You missed a lot of Herschel's great years because those are the best years of a running back when he first comes out of college. Yeah, that is a, that's a good uh, that's a good comparison. That's a good uh, that's perfect. That's a good way to say it. Uh, yeah, my, my he, tag, you know, Ron Simmons, my tag team partner, he played against uh, Herschel. He oh, said, I, I imagine he don't ever talk. He, he said, don't ever play. Oh, he said it, it hurt to tackle Herschel. <laughs> he, is that what he said? Yeah. You know what? Now Simmons is a guy I could sit on. We could go day, we could go days talking. I mean, especially Ron. I was not at his level. You know, I'm like, I'm just like the hokey tokey. I remember Chuck Fairbanks come up to me and says, Nord, you'd be you'd be a pretty damn good lineman if they didn't untie if they'd untie your knees. <laughs> kind of like I'm walking knee knot. You know, I'm like, I says, Chuck, you don't think I've been battling that my whole life, you son of a bitch? Well, you don't say that. <laughs> and then so, I, go ahead, Jerry. So the so the the, the generals let you go in. How do how how do you make that cold phone call to to uh to Bird and how do you how do you make that transition? Uh that yeah, that's a good question, Jerry. I don't know when that else I uh, how it I made it was Kurt Henning had been giving me elbows since he got in and you know just because of Larry, but I mean he was in it and Kurt was so you know Kurt was off the chart. I I think he went too far how he was much he was into it, but he uh -huh. was such a great human being. I yeah. mean, and we were so close um, since we were kids, and he'd be going, you know, like Kurt, he'd go like Nord. You gotta listen to me. You gotta get in this, man. And he'd be looking around to make sure nobody <laughs> listening, like you know, uh, you know. And he'd go into McDonald's and he'd go, "Does a Ray or K Fave work here?" And he'd be doing this, man. I'd go, "Hey, Kurt, I, we never knew no Fabes, did we?" And he's already, and I'm not in wrestling, you know. So, <laughs> but that's how. So I you don't have a clue what he's talking about when he's saying all that. I know it has something to do with pro wrestling, but I did not even know the term. <laughs> Kurt was so damn good for this business, you yeah. guys. He protected it to the yeah. ever-loving end, yeah. but then also uh, had uh, fun any way he did it. Very unselfish in the ring, yeah. very unselfish in the locker room. Yeah. He wasn't a cheapskate. Um, you guys, I go up to him, I go, yeah, well, I paid for your meal, and bar tabs let me see for about seven years straight i don't know <laughs> what that comes to you know but yeah so kurt got me in and uh and of course kurt he he and brad now brad even told me he was just talking to me the other night about the first year he stretched kurt <laughs> there, is, there, there is no ego on this either because we you know you can talk to guys you're that close uh, and he said yeah he goes uh uh the first year was like a couple years before we got into pro wrestling and it, kurt always had a thing like my dad i can't let my dad down on this you know and then he'd get serious and then you, you'd try to but kurt young he didn't want to put in the gym work 
You know, he just didn't. And uh, everybody was zooming by him and, and, and all that. But then he got in and then he got me in to brag. And Eddie, Eddie also hung around long enough to get a payday out of me too. But, <laughs> but Ed, that's what Eddie does. And Eddie's just a class. But how- Oh, how Eddie, Eddie's fantastic. And he was a great trainer too. I mean, he had his hand in a lot, a lot of great talent. A lot of guys. And uh, of course him and a guy named Wally Carbo. Right, Wally, I'd go, yeah. like, I'd go up to Eddie, I'd go, Eddie, uh, this leather jacket, this Wilson's, it's getting kind of old too. And uh, God, I think I got two at home I can get you. Because <laughs> him and Wally were dealing in some uh, uh, st st stolen property. You know, Eddie, <laughs> don't mind me. Eddie don't mind me saying this. Well, they're going to arrest a 96-year-old man. <laughs> but this was, this was 40 years ago. You know, so I mean, and then he said, I'd say, Eddie, I need a TV, one of them big Zeniths, you know, like the 40-inch, you know. Can you, is that available? I said, God, I don't see what I could do. God, what a, <laughs> and Eddie goes like this, God, what a good choice that was. <laughs> you know, Eddie did such a, that's how Eddie is. He's, but, and being in that first camp, I had blown my knee out the last game I ever played in the USFL. I had a blown my knee out, so I came home with a cast, and, uh, uh, then it was time to be a pro wrestler. Then I, the first of all, I did, went as far as I could go in the in playing football, and that was might have been a miracle, you know. But so now I'm gonna try to listen to Kurt and uh, meet Brad Rankins. Well, I knew Brad was because I followed amateur wrestling, you know. So uh, grow, growing up, everybody was a fan of the 72 Olympics, right? right. Very, right. We, we can name them, right? right. Well, Hellickson, Peterson, Chris Taylor, Dan Gabe, and we grew up on that. Kurt grew up on them too. Right. But he, so anyways, I'm in Brad's, I meet, I get to meet Brad, he lives out there in Hamill, and Bradshaw, you've been out there, and I don't know, have you, were you around that house, Jerry? The what? Jerry, were you, were, you, were you at Brad's house? The training? No, house? I've, I've never been to Brad's house. No. Anyways, you didn't miss much. It's really not the. <laughs> well, you. I really missed a tree, though. I wanted to suplex oh that my damn tree. <laughs> well, that, the worst that thing is, is that tree ain't getting stretched by Brad. Damn. Well, that's I, can leave, I can leave that part out. I just want yeah. the tree. <laughs> This week's episode of Stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw is proudly brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped now sells beard products. That's right, they are once again revolutionizing men's grooming with the brand new Beard Hedger Pro Kit. From a beard trim to a fresh shave, the technology behind the Beard Hedger Pro Kit allows you to shape your signature beard look. Just use promo code BAB for 20% off and free shipping. The cordless trimmer has a rotary wheel that gives you 20 hair cutting lengths, all with one guard. No more messy drawers full of extra add-ons. And it gets better. The Beard Hedger is also waterproof. They have created four dermatologist tested formulations for your post-trim care. There's the beard shampoo and conditioner. All your hair is different. Your beard hair is more coarse and easier to damage than the hair on your head. That's why the kit has made shampoo and conditioner specifically designed to moisturize, reduce ingrown hairs, and replace natural oils and promote beard health. Next, the kit has Manscaped beard oil, an essential for your main facial accessory. Cap off that with beard balm. Promate that shapes, styles, and moisturizes and tames for a sculpted look. The Pro Beard Kit also comes with three free gifts a beard brush, comb, and scissors to ensure your beard is ready to impress. All that and 20% off in free shipping with the code BAB. That is code BAB at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BAB. Well, that's it. And they all, he also had this gray leather dummy that looked like a wooden round shape figures. And inside of it was sand. <laughs> that thing was almost worse than the freaking thing. And, and Brad, you know, he's got 
He so he was so athletic in his day. He was pigeon toed, bullied, and he can do like spins on his toes. I'm like going, uh, my legs don't spin that way, <laughs> you know. So, anyways, that's how I got in. Was uh, you know you could tell a lot of different, but Kurt Henning, Kurt Henning got me in, and which Brad Rankin says, really though, I mean, because you anybody stamped with Brad's name that you went through his camp, you were a, there was something to talk about now. Yeah. Now you can get in, right? That's I, John, I was the same way. That's how I got my job in Texas. That's how I got my job in Japan and, and, and in Europe. When they found out Brad trained me, they hired me sight unseen. Yeah. Because yeah, Brad had such a good name of training guys. Cause he'd already, he'd and already he said me. that. He said that, he said that about you. And uh, yeah, so I get it. Uh, he knows I, I'm behind on everything and I don't even know who a lot of guys are, but um, he, do, he does have that power that I, that I, I was just telling, I said, Brad, we got, we should do something for you, but he's so freaking such a hermit, man. <laughs> yeah. He, he'd come around some, you know, when Brock was first, first came back after the UFC, he'd come around some and Brock, and when Brock first became main event guy, he'd come around some, you know, and right. Brock would bring right. him in and, Brad would hang around. Everybody go meet him. You know, was, everybody loves him, but he he yeah. wouldn't come around much. Then he would he leave, just and disappear. You're right, Brad. You, I mean, the, there ain't much to say. He, you, what you see is what you get, and, and he don't like bullshitters, and he just don't like. How could you say uh, drama or I don't know? Yeah. We talk, you know, and as buddies do, you know, he he. Uh, he was married to a home small town gal. And I remember bringing our wives out to eat. And one time, you know, I mean, we're, we're passing Vicodins under the table to each other. And, you know, and the, the girls, all of a sudden, our wives are looking at each other. They're laughing, having a good time. Of course, they didn't know we we're passing Vicodins, but I mean, that's just the, what we did. Not now. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember the one night we always talk about, you can answer it if you want, just tell me, uh, was that our wives were actually laughing and having, just, they were laughing. And girls up here, they have a harder time showing their, you know, they just, they're so stone-faced, you know, they're prim and proper, but I, that's what I think. Maybe not, I don't know, but we always thought like, all the stars had come together that night to align everything perfect where our wives were actually laughing. We're like, thank you, God. You know, so John, did he ever that. get you because you had to shoot for conditioning at the end? And Brad yeah. always went with me. He like, because I just come out of pro football just like you did. And Brad, Brad went with me for about three straight months. Did he? <laughs> it was it was a long three months. <laughs> did he get God, you? He was, so, he was so deceivingly deceivingly strong. Well, I'll tell you, we in our camp. Um, yeah, I know that's a good question, but I, I gotta say, I never I didn't ever shoot all the way with Brad. Um, we pummeled, but who I did shoot with every day was Rob uh, Rick Steiner. Right. Uh, sure. Yeah. He and was in your camp Rob, too. Yeah, and and you, you got to remember now, guys are showing up. This is 1984, and I suppose I, you know, I mean, I was in good shape. I had, you know, I was benching a lot. Had good, you know, all that, all the right shit. And I'm showing up and everybody's peeing, drawing their lines in the dirt like dogs, man. And here it comes. I am going to make this. I don't know about everybody else, but F you guys, if we got to throw fists, we're going to do it. And that's the truth. You, it was that intense. Now you got Rob Rickstein, who's from Michigan, so he ain't a local kid. So I don't like him right away. <laughs> I'm like, if he thinks he's going to come here because he was second in the big 10 at heavyweight f him it ain't gonna happen with me so i'm like thank god i wish i would have amateur anyways but i gotta say and and if you ask rob i i think he'll say the same thing as we went every day and i think we were about a push i think we we're about 50 50 um because uh uh i mean i was about 310 but i i could 
you know, I could, if I, you know, if even a dumb football player like me, if you get it in on you and can get your arms clasped, you can just squeeze as hard as you can and good things happen. <laughs> but anyways, and then there was a couple local guys that were uh, bodybuilders that didn't make it. And a couple dudes that were like, like drug dealers, they didn't uh-huh. make it. Um, <laughs> they, they got, and then there was, uh, God, there was guys that you would know, and I don't even know, but that first camp, if you ask Brad, he, he always says, that was by far the hardest. I mean, all bets were off. I mean, it was like, I want to make this. And uh, yeah, it was a temp. But, uh, and of course, I think because of Kurt and then Brad being the way he is, and I could just, you know, I mean, I was, Brad knew I was coming and I think he just kind of opened up his heart and, and his house to me, even before he knew me because of the resume I had. Or whatever. Yeah. Brad's such a good guy. I mean, just, just a good hearted, good person. You know, no one has ever said anything bad about Brad Rogans. They Everybody loves him. No, no, Brad, I and mean, you're right. And, and I'm, I'm just like you sitting there. We're saying the same thing. Doesn't surprise me. This is how it always goes. <laughs> but, but you know, guys know who Tiger Chung Lee is, right? Right. Yes. Yeah, sure. Tiger Chung Lee. So Brian Adams used to be able to, God bless his heart when he was alive. He used to be able to do this imitation of Tiger Chung Lee to the point to perfect right and he'd talk uh, to, hi brad and this is the tiger <laughs> you know so brian w- w- and we're all screaming and this is 1991 we said brian you got to call brad up and rip because brad uh didn't really like tiger yet they just had some animosity in the locker room or something like we knew brad was just like that, ah, just, just, but fuck him, you know, what but he, he, uh, so we had Brian call. So Brian calls Brad at home. This is 1991. <laughs> and he says, hi, Brad, this is the tiger. And Brad goes, oh, uh, hi, tiger. Brad, um, uh, uh, last the time we work, uh, you, you don't sell, so I maybe kick your ass now. <laughs> Brad's like, he because Brad told me this is what he was doing during this. He's looking at the phone going, he's got his wife over there watching, you know, Johnny Carson. And he's what well, yeah, I'll try. Yeah, we can work it out. <laughs> yeah. And he goes, Brad. You don't come to Japan. I'm going to be at the airport, going to kick your ass. <laughs> and we are laughing so hard when Brian's telling this because Brian took time out of his home life at home <laughs> to do this rip. And the last thing he said he heard on the phone before they both hung up was Brad scream, Tiger, next time I see you, your elbow's going to be in your ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. Brad will tell you. Yeah, but oh, we Brad, Brad loved to rib people. I mean, loved to rib people. He did. He did. And he still does. And he does it so sneaky because you, you're always giving him, giving him a pass that maybe he's just a little bit old or maybe all that amateur kind of. You don't have the personality as pro guys do or something. I don't know. But yeah, he's sneaky as hell, Bradshaw. Tiger was in that movie with Arnold, wasn't he? What didn't uh, Tiger end up getting in a, in a couple of movies? He was in the scene with the sauna, right? Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. He, he did. Took, he took a backdrop from Arnold. I, you're right, and I yeah. even forget who Tiger is. She's at the gathering. He was. Yeah, I just seen him at the last August. First yeah, because he told me the story. They're gonna do this fight scene with Arnold in the in the Russian sauna, wherever it was, yeah, and he just called. give me a backdrop, and Arnold says, "I." I don't didn't know what it was, and he, he showed Hell it to yes. me. It takes a backdrop oh, in the movie. <laughs> very good, very good. And you know, they brought him in. Um, I'm at the gathering. Uh, Marty does this deal at the gathering at the in Charlotte last August, and I'm like Tiger Chung Lee. I said, "What 
in a bank account, these guys. How many people you think you're going to draw with Tiger Chung Lee? Come on. What? I'm like, so I'm saying that right in front of Tiger. <laughs> you need a nicer guy. You know, I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I was just trying to figure out how do you spend 3000 and have two people come up to him at the table? I don't, you know, <laughs> so... Of course, we're always thinking that. Let's call it. But yeah, I talk, I forgot all about that movie. Yeah, part. yeah, yeah. I was I was in Japan with Tiger right after the movie came out, working for I think for uh, Tenru. I think I think it was Tenru. Yeah, yeah. We were both working for Tenru. He had just split from I guess from Anoki. Yeah, the yeah, eyeglass uh, working guy. For, I, for Tenru, he's a little smaller group than Anoki, and yeah, Tiger Chung Lee was on the tour with. Why do they always say the same thing about Tenru? Tenru, uh, that's Sato. When I was going, a, a, a tenor is like a hook holder. Yeah. I'm like, I get it. You don't got to say that every time. <laughs> so he wanted to sell for him. Now I remember, John, he like a hook holder over here. You know, I'm like, I get it. <laughs> but the good thing about tenor was, you know how it was in Japan? It was blood guts. You know, you got with some young guy. Oh. They're going to kick your head off. Tenor would work with you. As long as, long as you're playing. was a night off it was a complete night moment. off so in the middle of this well, blood guts japanese tour all of a sudden you got tenry one night you're going outstanding yeah <laughs> thank you for knowing that <laughs> thank you for knowing that that's oh uh, but yeah well when i was with vince the they grabbed a group of guys to go over to japan and work for tenro because it just was he was just recruiting guys and I guess because I was taking backward bumps over the top rope, five of them every night, if he liked me or something, I don't know. But anyway, so he, I ended up working for Tenru for a long time back then while he was had his money, hand in the money with, the, I think the guy owned eyeglasses or something. Anyways, but what happened one night uh, there, just so you guys know, uh, I, don't, I don't really tell this, but the, the Undertaker, and me that now we're on the same card and mark and me are good friends i mean we go back to texas 80 in 1985 you know and and uh he's do they do the beller boom 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 him and paul bear with them percy and they're going down the aisle and you guys might know what i'm gonna say well the japanese might as well took his uh, earn and wipe their butt with it. Uh -huh. They hated it. It was a bust. Really? They like, yeah, you really, yeah. And I'm telling you, and Mark will tell you the same thing. Um, so now that's the first night. We're just thinking that was a bad town. Now we do the second night. The same thing. And then I think it was either the third or fourth night. They switched him and says, Nord, why don't you work with, with The Undertaker? Because they knew I could at least have an American match with him, a good one, you know. And it did. And then it worked. But here's the one thing, at least they knew back then in the early 90s, was that gimmick don't work here. Now, how long that held true, if any amount of time? I don't know, because I went out of the business for years. So I don't know yeah, because if I, what I'm I, saying I, stuck. I worked with Taker, more with Mark, uh, as part of WWE tour in Budokan Hall. He, uh, probably Did about, you? Probably about ten or twelve years later. Was that, and he and he sold the place out. Uh, probably two thousand four. Well, there I'm doing my mouth again. <laughs> my, my mouth. John's running his mouth. <laughs> no, 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 no. It was it was it was, it was later. You know when, when the character and the character had gotten so over. We were in Budokan, and you know he. Well, yeah. there you go. He put it off. He put it. Well, now and, 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 and that's a character. It takes a while to build, too. You know, yeah. He, but but well, he yeah, was. When we went back know, to I, Japan. I, I, I don't mean that malicious. Or oh any, yeah. But there you go, Bradshaw. That, that's a perfect thing that I needed to hear because I don't ever. I don't even know stuff like that. Well, there you go. But it it here's the point. I think we get is it it takes a couple years on a gimmick. For the, before oh, yeah. the Japanese will trust you. And back then, the Japanese style was completely different. Well, that's it, it, it changed. Great. By the time we went back in 2004 or whatever year it was, maybe in two, 2003, 2005, somewhere in that yeah. range, uh, 
right, it had changed. They were they had signs. They were doing chants. You know, back then they oh, just sat there. sold the place out. Well, there you go. That's that's it. it and like I, I figured that's the way it went, but I just don't ever talk about it. I'm just doing what I remember. But sure. yeah, and uh, I'm hoping I run into him here at this uh, thing coming up before WrestleMania because uh, I did get message to him and he did reply, but he wouldn't give the phone number. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. Jeez, I don't know. I might be Mark on you. I might start calling you in the middle of the night. Just be careful with that phone number. No, I just got to give him a shot. <laughs> I'm having fun. You guys know. We, but, we had wrestled that night and we were, uh, I'd broken my foot. And, you know, nowadays you take six weeks off. Back then you did. They put, they put a steel plate in the bottom of my boot so I could work. And they made it a no disqualification match with Taker. Uh, you know, hey, so I'm doing a podcast right now. I'll call you when it's my, over. My foot is broken. And uh, so we go out there and have this no DQ match. In the middle of it, I got this cane from this guy and I hit Taker uh, with the cane. Did you? <laughs> and Taker says, Did you take that cane from that man? And I said, Because the guy was, needed the cane. Oh, that sounds like it. something he'd say. <laughs> he, he said, said it said, in that Houston accent. Yeah, I said, Yes, I did. He goes, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, You're the best. <laughs> Is that what he said? What oh, a yeah. great memory. <laughs> that's a great, what a great, that's the kind of shit that happens in wrestling that you just, if nobody else remembers, you remember. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. It was, it was one of those great moments, you know, cause like you that's did, awesome. I, you know, I had tons and tons of matches with him. You know, just like, just like you did. Yeah. Oh man. Well, you, if I ever think I'm unique, I'm definitely not because um, I know that he's wrestled so many hundreds and hundreds of matches with so many guys. That, yeah, I'm so glad that you know him like we know him. So I know, yeah, I know what well, you're knowing exactly what I'm talking about. John, John, tell us a little bit as if we're talking about Taker, we'll, we'll jump ahead to it there. But you had so much before that at time, too. But the one of the most memorable moments in, in Undertaker's career is when you tried to impel him. And it was so believable back in those days, yeah. too. You know, it wasn't, wasn't all these special effects and all that stuff. It, no. it was just you. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Well, it was uh, Toledo, Ohio. And again, here we go. Uh, uh, well, this one, the piss testing was intense. And guys like me and Hawk were, were scrambling a few nights here and there. So uh, they, they, it's pissed. Well, first of all, it's backwards because he says, yeah. Uh, I'm, and this would always be grateful to Mark Calloway for is they went up to him and he, something in the matches weren't going on TV. They were worried that he, he was things were not going as good as what they want because they know they were going to go to the moon with them on pushing them and he asked them who can you have a good match with and again i'm grateful to mark the rest of my john nord just that simple and man uh i didn't know that when they came to me they came to me and said we're going to run a hell but and they're doing a piss test and i'm dirty <laughs> Yeah, and I'm dirty. Now I'm scratching. So I just called my says, listen. Uh, my wife's, they knew my wife was pregnant. And uh, I said, uh, listen, she's having problems. I, I got to go home. I know it's a bad lie. I'm sorry, God, but <laughs> that's what I said. So it got me out of there for a night long enough to dip the piss test, come back. I don't know why I said that. I didn't even have to. But anyway, so now reset the button. I don't know what we're telling in uh, after old Toledo. But uh, now we're on to the next night and uh, or the next night after that. And they're still on. They're going to. And I remember Pat coming up to me going, are you guy, you, you think you could, you guy maybe, could you get that to stick in the ring? I said, you're doing an angle with me and the Undertaker. And uh, how, how big, how big and heavy is this sword? 
I'll get do. I'll get it to stick in freaking jello. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I'll do I'll put on a pink leotard and <laughs> dance around whatever you want. But no, in all sincerity, I said, yeah, I think I can. And how it was steel, but it still was a prop sword, you know. And uh, there was a sword I'd take on the road. And this is a sword that I had to save for TVs because I didn't know when it was going to break, but I liked the way it looked. So anyways, uh, we just did it. And uh, he, I said, make sure you move. He says, <laughs> yeah, I will. So what I, I think I could have sped it up a little bit. I took it both hands. Howard is saying the first thing I want to do is make sure it's stuck. But they wanted it to stick. So it did. And I think I, I think I stabbed it in the ring a little too uh, late after he moved. That was the only thing I regret. I could have been closer and it could have been sooner, but it still worked. Uh, and, uh, and I remember after going out, I took off my tunic and threw it on Mark and, uh, walked away. And then he sat up and I walked, barked fast to the dressing room. But, and I'm thinking that was, that was good. I nailed it. I know I did. I could feel it. Um, and then sure enough, they come up and go, well, we loved everything, but why did you take your tunic off? I said, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I just trying to get heat. I don't know. You know, and for some reason, they did not like that because it wasn't, I don't know, it was out of character or something. I don't know. You know, tell me how, tell me how they think. I don't know. Uh-huh. That was it. And, uh, but I'm grateful as heck to that, uh, you know, I I had a real, it was the best year I ever had on money but it was hard on some guys because i for once in my life i got the feeling that i always heard about and didn't ever experience firsthand where my paychecks were bigger than nine out of the ten guys in the locker room paychecks for about six months because i was working with undertaker um just that simple and I mean that to nowadays, no, but back then. So you get uh, first time in my life, I had to be really careful not to talk about money or anything because everybody's going shit. My shit, I'm on the road seven days a week, and then my you know my check was twenty eight hundred bucks or something crazy, you know. And and I opened up my big mouth once. I think it was Steve Kern, and Steve said, "Johnny, you can't say that." And they let us know what you made, and and everybody else is making this. I says, "Gee, Steve, it's not you like you to voice your opinion." <laughs> you know the thing about it though, John, is if you're a little bit late, it's okay. If you're a little <laughs> bit early with a sword, somebody dies. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good point, Brad. So if you're gonna miss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, know. good point. Especially, yeah, that it wouldn't have been a good trip home on the plane. No. But I could. What I should have did is, I wish I could have picked out a piece of his clothing that I would stab rather than the actual body. You know, so if things didn't go well, oh well, the clothing got stabbed the end of the mat. Then, but yeah, uh, it was good enough to to go good but you know you still and of, and of course you if had you guys have interviewed a lot of guys that say the same thing that wasn't in the plans and all that stuff but listen i'm not coming from a place like that i never did i was always grateful to know the guys i knew to uh, to have guys put up with my shit the way i got to put up with theirs because i had i i i wasn't no smooth road either to deal with you know and when you first started you you got to did you tag with bruiser brody you had a lot of influence from bruiser right yeah i did uh and actually uh me and frank i first got together with him in 85 in japan and boy you talk about a hot commodity holy smoke you talk about uh i i never seen nothing like that right I'm like, holy smokes. And he was making 14 grand a week. It was the tour that hit, and this is my first tour in, in Japan. Him and Snuka 
that it was the one where they walked off. They walked away from the money on the train. You right, guys I've heard about that, but tell for people that aren't, didn't, don't know about it. Tell tell, tell what happened. Um, what happened was it was a tag team tournament, and uh, uh, him and him and Snooka were geared up and planned up to win it all. And something happened in the plans where they wanted him and Jimmy to do a job to, uh, I don't know what top two guys it would have been. Was it uh, Anoki and, I think it was Anoki and Fujinami, but anyways, it don't matter. But they walked, I remember being there last night uh, we still got one match left and i'm thinking great hey frank hey, frank told me nothing but he i knew something was up and uh all of a sudden frank started getting his uh going in the zone and i know something's up but i don't know what's up and i was friends to him by then because we had done 30 days and uh together so he was trying to help me out as a young you know kid and and the next thing you know, he's grabbing his bags, F this, F that. And Snook, I'll never forget, uh, Jimmy was right by me. He's, brother, I, my partner goes, brother, I got to go. And they left. And, you know, I mean, Frank, four times 14 is $64,000 he walked away from. Uh, even if Jimmy was getting seven, eight grand, he walks away from 30000 and you got to show up with your folks, with your wife waiting at the airport. Sorry, honey, no money. Uh, that's a good way to get divorced. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, and that's how guys, but here's what happened with Frank was, I mean, I told Barbara that last August when I seen her and she says, John, her, nobody. No, and I'll say, I even remember what Frank told me. He said when he seen you guys standing at the airport. And uh, his son, Jeff, goes, he was six years old. He says, Daddy, that wasn't, that wasn't a good tour. And uh, Brody goes, that's right, son. It was not a good tour. And Barbara already knew by over the phone. But it was a real dramatic moment for him and his family. And as you guys know Brody, that's his kind of story anyways. It would be dramatic because Frank was so uh, dialed into that type of drama in the sports world, you know, and he was just that way. And uh, snuck up. I don't even know what happened to Jimmy, but it wasn't he. But he did tell me, and Barbara told me too, that the Japanese actually brought the money right to his house in uh uh, where does he live? Where do you live? Not San Antonio. He was from San Antonio, but I don't know where he New lived. New Mexico, at the time. Santa Fe, I think. Wherever he was living, and still, and she used to live. But yeah, they brought the money in a suitcase right to his house. And I don't know the details of 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 the intricacies. I think it was just flat. They switch, and now they want him to do a job, and they were supposed to win it. And all of a sudden, you. How many guys are going to walk away from that kind of money? They got you. No money, no job, no money, right? Right, yeah, because for those that are listening, you, you get paid a, a Japanese tour after your last match, yeah. right before the last night when you go home. And so if you don't do that last match, <laughs> you, you don't get paid. Oh, they got you by the kahunis, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Man, right? Yeah, I was wondering, like, God, why, why not in weekly? Why is this all at once deal? Because they got you. That's they why. got you. And they also <laughs> have. They also on Monday had your passport. Also. That's right. They, uh, they got your passport they? too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> why we keep it safe for you? And you know, if there's any problems, we will work it out with our lawyer. These <laughs> I still want it back now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They took your passport the first thing when you as yeah. as you got off. Yeah. We just need it for, for office reasons. Yeah, okay. exactly. <laughs> yeah, I remember being uh, with Dick Murdoch watching the, at the theaters in Tokyo, uh, uh, Back to the Future. 
you know, on, I think it was Thanksgiving Day. And uh, I remember thinking, what a great movie, but it's so weird seeing a Japanese. <laughs> oh, I go see him all the time. Whole time I'm thinking, just get me the hell out of here. <laughs> right? Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, until you get dialed in and you're making a lot of jing and you got jing in the bank, uh, Japan can be a great place. And all the stories are fun and the hard rock and the ah, da 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 da. That's all great stuff. But I got a little wife and babies with no money in the bank. You know, so give me the check and I'll get home. Uh, my seventeen fifty a week. You know, I got paid my first tour. I got, it's a lot of money. Four weeks. Let me see. Six grand. Um, you know, I'm a rich man. Right. That's funny. That's funny. It's funny how values change over the years. Holy moly, you guys! I'm so uh, right. But that's the fun about talking on stuff, stuff like this you guys is yeah. it's you really do know what how what used to be it's easy yeah. to kind of glide over and think well this guy signed for yeah. two million that ain't that much hey no matter what a million dollars is still a lot of money yeah. Yeah. oh my god i don't even i don't know we're gone we don't we're, know. We, we, with Frank, for Frank there, he was so unpredictable. But, man, if he was your friend, he was your friend forever. And, uh, and you know, that's what I really enjoyed about Frank. You always yeah. knew where you stood with Frank, too. I mean, there was no dilly-dallying around, you know. If he didn't like you, you knew in the locker room he didn't like you. <laughs> oh, man, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Um, it, was so, it was so funny because uh, – uh, I remember when he died, but I talked to Barbara over the phone, you know, but it had been, uh, I don't know how many years, 30, it was 35, uh, and I I still hadn't talked to her, and just, and I finally ran into her at Waterloo, Iowa last summer, whenever it was, when was it, Virgo, brother? July. July. Well, it was last year, yeah, you were there, that's when I had COVID, I couldn't make, I didn't make the trip out there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I think Spivey met that one too. Yeah, there no so yeah, Spivey's wife got real bad sick, so that's he, he right. Have, Annie, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. Uh, but not to roll on too long here, you guys. It, uh, but uh, Frank, we did uh, we did a couple small towns that, like one was Little Falls, Minnesota, and and I got him hooked into a promoter that. It was giving us chump change, but he still did it. My, I come from a car family, so we got my dad had a big car lot, and uh, remember bringing Frank by there uh, twice, and the boy, everybody goes, boy. I said, do they always look that way? I said, no, nah, he's a little more intimidating than most, of them. <laughs> you know, and because Frank had that look, and yeah. uh, but we. Uh, uh, anyways, a quick, uh, it was, it was, a, we had a wrestle rock, which was April of 86, I think. And Vern had a big show at the, wherever it was, downtown Minneapolis. And, uh, uh, Frank used to like to go to head shops. They still call them that. <laughs> I don't know. Do they even have them anymore? <laughs> Well, the skulls and the... I, I know what a head shop is. I took Frank to a couple of them here in Florida. <laughs> that, is, that, that, is that So I'm saying the right word. Okay. Yeah, yeah, well, sure. It was, uh, you know, it was skulls and pipes and, you know, all that, right? But it, pay, is paper, it pay, papers and pipes and anything you want. Jerry well, knows I mean, exactly what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> but, but is that... Is it, let me say, is it really bad to say it right now? <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, no. No, okay, statute so, limitations is way out. <laughs> okay, Brad. Thanks. I guess well, you guys both are. So, uh, but he, you know, so I got my my uh, buddy's si uh, sister in there, the guy who started the gym, Jimmy Youngner, Bradshaw, and uh in the front of my brand new 86 pickup and uh were squished my wife 
she's five foot, a hundred pounds, you know, so we're not, but Frank, I knew Frank liked these places. And I says, Hey, you want me to pull in there at a place called down in the Valley. And it had opened, but I thought, what the, what the heck is he buying? Hey, Josh, Virgo, Justin. I don't know. I've got something I was going to show you guys quick, but he went in this store and, and I remember going with him. Josh, give me that. Sure. So he was telling me, I said, I got a hard time. Uh, I remember saying, saying his, his feet were having a little snug time getting in the boot. You know, I think he mentioned like either he had the, he, when he pull it out, he's worried about the straps breaking or something. So I pull in this place just out of courtesy, just stretch our legs, and they sell everything there. Well, he says, "Hey, brother, I found. Look at what I found." I, I said, "What is it? A shoehorn?" He goes, "Yeah, man, I slip right in." And he buys this shoehorn. So now let's fast forward. My wife, uh, <laughs> I still talk to her. I got three of the most beautiful kids on God's green earth. So I says, Hey, is there anything in the box of my, uh, in the garage to make just double check? Well, they find this. Oh, wow. It's a shoehorn from <laughs> down in the Valley that Frank bought that they never did. Uh, he never did get out of the front end of my pickup, but <laughs> it works really slick. It's got like a deer antler. Oh. And this is, so I just, it's like my wife, she goes, yeah, I think it's a shoe. I'm like, shoehorn? What? Do I, what? I thought it was kind of a pretty cool thing. You know, it happened to me like a month ago. So anyways, I didn't really plan on bringing that up, but. Oh, I'm glad you did. What, what, that's a great memorabilia, you know, that, that yeah. personal and close to you. I mean, uh, Frank Goodish yeah. gave it to you, left it for you. <laughs> yeah, great. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it's, it's. It, it was just uh, a, a memory and all that. And Frank, you, 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 you now, now you you got a couple of your mannerisms in the ring for Frank, also, right? You carried those on. Yeah, we said, well, well, we were going to be tag partners. Right. He he liked me because you guys know Brody. He liked, let's put it this way, kind of guys that are trying to be uh, athletic and have yeah. like an athlete background. He did not do well with guys like <laughs> that had no athletic ability, that had no you, you know, John, that, that's one of the best ways I've ever heard Frank uh, describe because, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm, I'm a small guy. But you know what? He, I had a ton of respect for Frank because I was an athletic guy and I would stand up and, and battle back with him. He never, had, he never had a problem with anybody that would stand up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And uh, it was those, all always those guys that would, you know, just kind of back down from him, and it had had no had no guts in them to him. Exactly, or they always wanted to take the easy role. Yeah, you know, um, Frank did not, and and you you. He, he was a hard worker in the ring. He was a very hard worker in the ring. Yes, he was. Um, he definitely, and you know, like let's say you come from a. Uh, school that let's say you're an all four time all American from Oklahoma or something, you know, or from Minnesota, it doesn't matter. He, he, he would, you would have a harder time getting close to Frank if you're like that. Right. But now, if you're a small town Montana state wannabe guy like me, he chummed right up easy because he knew. I think it comes down to Jerry too, as just being a respectful human being that. You know, you, you, you weren't a thief. You, you didn't talk smack. You were respectful. He he figured that out on people right away. Yeah. And to all of us guys talking here right now that we know we're that way. So we all fared well with a guy like Frank Goodish, you know. Hey, John, I, I, I got to ask you the one story that uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've I heard. So you face that. You're like. Oh my goodness! I've heard so many different versions of this story of <laughs> Sheik and you. So I've got to ask you, what happened oh, with Sheik and you? There's only one version. <laughs> well, I figured there's one version is the truth, but over the years, well, you know, hear so okay, much about yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so here we are. So here we are. We're going, and uh, 
uh, the boys are going to Edmonton, Canada, and uh, we're we're flying in from wherever, uh, and we're in customs, you know, and the half the boys are a little bit looped up, and the other half are, you know, but I know this: we got to go right to Edmonton uh, to the stadium right away uh, and get to the matches. Um, it's probably in the afternoon and I'm sitting there and there's cameras and there's a planter and there's a planter here and there are plastic planters with the fake uh, dirt and chips in them. And uh, the guys are uh, trying to get pot over, you know, they all, the half the guys got their little stash. Now I can honestly say, I just, I did everything else, but I didn't smoke pot for some reason. I don't know why. But anyways, the sheet comes up to me out of nowhere. Cosgrove, not Adnan, Cosgrove comes up to me out of nowhere. Uh, brother, I hope you don't mind. I said, <laughs> what? He said, oh, that, that, I, I feel the pressure. I put the gimmick in your bag. I'm like, <laughs> what did you just say? And there like customs guys 10 feet from me all over the place you know and i'm just going oh my heart like this <laughs> yeah. now. now i know something's up and he ain't bullshit i know that <laughs> and uh so once i'll make it short i just went oh my god i'm i'm, 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 I'm my wife my uh, i'm screwed up I, i'm gonna do 30 years in a Canadian jail. Oh man! <laughs> you know, it was dead serious. And I went, okay. And I'm looking at the cameras. I walk around my bag once. I'm still looking at those cameras. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to be very cool and presentable. Then I just just reached down, zipped it, felt around, acted like I was just being cool. Well, then I felt it. Act like I zipped it up, but I had it in my hand. Z zipped it, and then I just dropped it in the planter, and I did it. I got it through. I knew what? it went smooth, but now I'm trying to get out of the country as quick as I can into Canada. And I'm just going, ah, you guys are so funny. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I'm just going, I don't even know how to act. And so I make it through. And I just couldn't even believe what happened. I mean, it's it's one thing that maybe I'll not even ever tell anybody, but I just couldn't help it. I, I mean, I'm not a guy that's just all of a sudden gonna, you know, get in your face. But that was so off the chart. We get to the Edmonton, Calgary, and it was a funny deal because a guy named Herb Brooks, who was the coach for the. 80 Olympic team. He was the head coach for Edmonton then. The was it Oilers? Yeah. Yeah, Oilers. Uh, yeah. Pro hockey team. So so we show up and we run into Herb Brooks. Well, he's from Minnesota, so he knows a lot of guys we know. Now we got Darso and Henning and all these guys were just going crazy because Brooks is there, you know. And we're oh, he's eating it up. But in the whole time, I remember it. I'm going to run into Cosgrove now. Here we go. And I think Lonzo was the agent. And I says, hey, hey Jack, at fucking Cosgrove, excuse my language, you guys, uh, Cosgrove put uh, put some stuff in my bag in customs. And uh, before anything happens, I want to I wanna pass. So they had, oh, I think they probably had three locker rooms almost, but it was kind of like, one shitty one, one good one, one, you know, a month. and he had purposely trying to stay away from me, I know. But he was in this little locker room, and I said, I just got to go do this. It's time to just go get in his face, because if I don't, there's something wrong with me. You know, he just put everything out. So I walk over there, and uh, I go up to Kaz, I says, what is wrong with you? And I started going off on him, and and uh, he 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 started backing up, and he started 
going to poor me. And I stayed on him verbally. And then he started coming back at me. Like, well, I'm going to take so much shit. I mean, that's a bad thing to do, but don't scream at me. It's not that bad a thing. Oh, wait. Uh-huh. And so he started coming back, coming back, coming back. And then I just unloaded a right on him. That's all I ever did. And he went down, but I wasn't there to see how bad it was. I just knew he'd be back over to my side if he was going to come back at me or anything. So that's the story. But um, he was very much in remorse saying, hey, I got a family. And he's, you know, he's saying all that to, to Lanza and I think whoever else was there. And he was totally, but they, it was zero tolerance. They fired him right then and there. Wow. And you do feel bad when he's in that. You do feel bad for a guy when he's in that much stuff. Um, uh, of that much kind of pain and worry for his family. Now he's fired. But what he did overrode everything. So that was it. Did you ever find out why he put it in your bag? Because he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a freaking clue. Are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, man, I, I agree with you. He is freaking nuts. <laughs> It makes no sense at all. Uh, I know. I mean, I mean, he picks the biggest damn guy on the tour well, to yeah, load his gimmick off. <laughs> yeah, I put it in Brooklyn did. Brawler's bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, not so much to being even a, like who's a tough guy, who ain't a tough guy. Because you guys know the Iron Sheik. He, he doesn't uh, process things. He don't compute he, well, no. <laughs> no, he would have put it in uh, Hulk Hogan's bag or the Brooklyn Brawler's bag. He don't, he don't have a clue. So, yeah, that's why, and I definitely felt, no, you know, I, I just was glad. I've been in enough trouble in my life where uh, my, my poor wife didn't need that too back then, you know. Um, but it was always a bit of a s- s- struggle when you married a girl from our hometown, just, just like Kurt married a girl. Most of us, uh, maybe half of us did, but they knew our they knew our BS. They knew when we were like, you want me to come down there right now? <laughs> Who's there? Really? Who else right now? Oh, you got any gimmicks? Oh, they got my, my way, honey. I gotta go. She, they know that program. That, that was no longer allowed in my life. You know, that, that went the first 20 years that I knew her. The last 10, she didn't put up with it. So, <laughs> yeah, the Sheik, uh, John, always thought my name was Brad Shaw. He thought it was two <laughs> names. So he always called me Brad. He met my dad one time. He goes, ah, Mr. Shaw, your boy Brad is such a fine young man. My dad's <laughs> like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Yeah, he always thought my name was Brad Shaw. Did you, well, that is, that's that's perfect chic stuff too. Um, but, you know, just speaking of introducing to the family, I remember we are in Orlando once. Did you guys ever get to meet Steve Kern's dad or hear about? Oh, okay, uh, Colonel Kern. Yeah, I, I'm up here in Florida. I was here when uh, actually when Colonel Kern was released uh, from the POW. No it was, kid. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, I was here. Oh, yeah. what a great deal that you could write a book on that alone, Jim. Well, Steve has. Uh, Steve just come out with another book, so uh, just Steve? just here recently. Yeah. And uh, we'll probably have Steve Steve back on. We'll probably have Steve back on talk about his new book. But what a remarkable story about his father there, the longest reign of POW, and not once but twice, uh, two time of POW. So it's absolutely incredible. And the thing that I always remember, and I, I know Stan said the same thing, was when you met him, you looked into his eyes, you knew something. There was an amount of pain amount of pain that was endured in those steel blue eyes that was beyond something I never touched, but he did. He did, man, and he survived. He survived the whole thing. He survived. Almost almost eight years he survived that stuff. Was that eight years? Yeah. Well, I know Steve told me he ran up to him 
hugged him, and he was just going, Steve, is that you? Yeah, Steve, yeah Steve, you? Steve had grown about six inches and gained about 90 pounds, and, you know, aged a few years. Or so. Steve, is that you? Is that you, yeah. son? Yeah. Well, put me down, then. <laughs> well, they're, they're, that story is pretty, pretty well known, yeah. but the one thing I'm picking up on you guys, too, is like Bradshaw. It's you're so funny when I bring up Brad. I can tell you really know Brad. And listening to a guy that really knows Brad Ringens and has been out to that house and the way you light up and smile about him, that will that is it's it's enjoyable to me just to listen to you guys uh on all this stuff you can bring up. You guys are good at this. You know, I, I mean that. This is fun, man. Well, great, man. What, what, are, what are you up to now, John? I know you and I are going to be in a, a couple of the same places coming up here real soon. So yeah. tell, us, tell us where you're going to be and what you got going on. And where Thanks, for asking. Can raise you. Thanks for asking you guys. We're going to be at... Um, you, 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 get, you get Gordon, Joe, Gordon, uh, Joe Jordan on his job calls him there. <laughs> Justin. Yeah. Fergo. Justin. <laughs> Just call him Fergo. Fergo Brothers. <laughs> like, Fergo Brothers to me are like Kind of like, uh, you know, uh, serial killer brothers. No, that's like, no, I'm just joking. But they are great dudes. But, yeah, Justin's my man. But, listen, uh, thanks for asking, Jerry Bradshaw. I'll be at March 31st at uh, a, a comedy club called The Ice House in Pasadena, California. And that's uh, two days before WrestleMania or one? One day. One day before WrestleMania, doing a stand up with the grappler, my old partner. Oh, it's great. Oh, Lynn. Wow. wow. I love great. Lynn. We didn't, get, we didn't get much chance to talk to you about Lynn. I, I love I love Lynn. Oh, I never deep. got to meet him until later, but we're what a great guy. Deep, yeah. Oh, he's he's phenomenal. Um, you know, uh he's he's just got a heart of gold. And we had did this deal real quick, you guys out in Portland. And he was the booker. And this is 1989. He says, what, what do you want to do tonight? I says, I don't know. Let's tie up Brian Adams to the ropes. One arm on this end, one arm on that. We'll tie him up. What can you do? And we're thinking of ways to humiliate a guy. You know, not only beat him up, but let's humiliate him. We're trying to really get some heat. Well, it's not a good heat getter, but we we said, let's go to the store. We'll buy gallons of milk and a bunch of cereal and we'll just pour it all over. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. So this Vice channel shows it. And uh, uh, my first gallon, I swear, it just exploded. It hit the first two rows. And uh, then we pour it all, God bless Brian right now, you know, but we, and it just, so we, we, I had four guys call me the first time it was on. And, and so we got, they started calling us the breakfast club. Out there. <laughs> well, that's great. Portland, uh, you know, three years before they went under two. And so anyways, I'll make it quick. We're at the ice house. And so, yeah, it'll be a fun stand-up. Uh, and then we're at WrestleCon March 31st through April 2nd. And Pro Wrestling Tees, Burger Brothers Promotions. And they make stuff like this little gimmick, Viking All right. Undertaker. But I'm waiting to go into that, go see that dead man guy. And I want to run into him. It's been a lot of decades. You know how you hope you run into a guy? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I saw him uh, recently. I can't remember uh, three or four weeks ago. He looks great. I mean, he looks fantastic. He's been training. He's been off. He just, he looks amazing. That's great. And I know Mark, I know his heart. You know, he's, 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 a, he's a good man. He's a right dude. He just is. You know, you can get all kinds of thought in your head, like, wow, all the money he made, and geez, they could have pushed him any harder. And, and of course, I'm going to say all that when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, me, me and you were like the Washington Generals to the glo to the Globetrotters against Mark. <laughs> we have, we, me, you and I have about the same record against The Undertaker. About yeah, 0 yeah. for 300. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that would be zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. You're yeah. right, Brad John. And it really does feel, it just feels good. About, what, what's great about a deal like this talking to you guys is like, I know I can put my 
my foot in my mouth and it does not matter. No. It doesn't matter anymore. What no. are you gonna everybody's ego is gone and it's it's very comfortable and like what Larry Henny now used to say, what are you gonna do? Beat up a grandpa? You know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well right. John, John, I also know in May, May 13th, you're out in St. Louis, and John and I both will be out in St. Louis for that right. event. Yeah, May May 13th? Yes, sir, May 13th. Yeah, um, yeah so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, definitely. Uh, I've never been to a Bruce Brody Memorial. Yeah, well, it'll be, it's great. Well, it's first, a, you know what? Bar 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 Barber's going to be there. Probably a lot of people that you know will be there. So, uh, Oh, for you know. sure. Well, Jerry... Here's what a hillbilly I am, Bradshaw. So they come up to me at the gathering or whatever this last place I was at. And, oh, Herb Simmons. I seen yeah. Herb at Waterloo, Iowa last summer. He says, hey, would you come to a Bruiser Brody Memorial? I'm thinking like a Bruiser Brody Memorial, like there's three people. And maybe it's a hotel room. Maybe it's... Maybe it's a small arena or something. I think I'll do you that favor, Herb. Sure. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking that's a favor, right? Oh, oh so Herb, Herb, Herb's smooth. Herbie's Next smooth. Thing I know, dialed in, there's like 35 people coming. So I'm like, I got to all talk to Herb and redo this money thing about, <laughs> about this favor. Like, seriously, Herb, you're going to ask like you like three guys or something that's just a favor? Yeah. And it's like a huge promotion. So I just got to get that out of my system. I don't know. <laughs> that's, great. that's great. I am such a shithead on money. I don't have any clue. Talk about a guy who talks too much. I'll talk myself right around it good payoff just leave it to me i'll get you right back at that 500 bucks <laughs> but bradshaw man i'm i'm actually because i i i actually well both i just i was going to take one at a time but this is an incredible interview just because i really would like to see run into you guys and shoot the shit and come up with some really funny memories you know i could tell i see it in you guys eyes you guys you guys know what i you we know, know we, we know how to have fun we, we <laughs> will have a good time we'll have a real good time uh, it's just so oh, john, john, to john, john 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 and i went to uh germany together we were over there like 28 days and uh we worked about 28 days and 30 days and yeah. uh, so we you know, traveled everywhere so you know, oh, at the end, at Georgia, at the end of the tour, you get a little hot, hot. So yeah. uh, sometimes in those morning bus rides, we'd come out. John would come in with sunglasses on and everything. <laughs> He'd take his sunglasses and be bruises under his eye. His elbows would be scared up. His elbows yeah. would be scared up. I come in. John would look at me. My arms were scared up, and we couldn't figure out what the hell happened. Finally, I think it was Undertaker came up to us and you guys finished beating the hell out of each other in parking lot. <laughs> We've gotten into that's a fight right. with each other. <laughs> oh, oh man, that is that's that is uh, on, but we were wrestling on some cobblestone parking lot. We, and neither one of us remember it. <laughs> it was yeah, it was uh it was, What's the old saying is so and so didn't remember, but I didn't, or you wonder if it even happened, you know. I don't know what <laughs> it right. is, but, but I'll tell you, uh, I know, uh, Brad did an early tour over there, and uh, one name that don't get brought brought up very often on these deals is Dick Murdoch. Oh, well, Dick and Dickie. Dickie and John go way back, and of course I go back even further than any of you guys were Dickie because I'm older than you guys. So I yeah. know Dickie since I started in the business, and he basically started in the business at the same time. So I what, what, a, what, a, what a friend he was! I mean, he was one of my all-time good friends. I knew I was that. Uh, yeah, I knew I Gab you set up when I said that name, Jerry. Yeah, yeah. yeah I got the tag Dick, with Dick. Yeah, I, I first I, started. I, I, you know, you know, everybody tell talks about Murdoch. <laughs> oh, well, we we keep his memory alive on this show because mm -hmm. he he comes up a lot. We, we John and I always tell the story about it. And John 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 wouldn't John's night would be complete unless he shares a story about what Dick Murdoch taught him about the Red River. 
Yeah, yeah. So let, let me tell you, John, this is a great story. So Murdoch, <laughs> <know it's> <laughs> Murdoch used to come pick me up and I was tagging. I was living with Bobby Duncan Jr., Bobby Duncan's kid in, Gar in Garland. Yeah. And we, were, we lived in, in a bad place. So Dick could come by and pick me up. We'd go to the town. Dick never let me drive. So I would always have to hand him Coors Light. And he's throwing about one out of every three out the window. And I realized I got to hand the mouth of the beer to him or yeah. he throw it out. Pointed. Right to it's just me and him. Left. Oh, that's it's great. Just for him. So he picks me up one morning, and we're going up to either Fort Sill or Lawton. We're going to Oklahoma, and uh, we're wrestling. I think I think we're wrestling the Von Eric boys. And and Dick says, "You're driving, kid." And so I get in there and drive. Dick's never let me drive, and I look over at him. He looks so sick, and I've never seen him stale. I've never seen him hungover. I said, "I said, Dick, you you want me to pull over?" Nope. Keep driving, kid. So I keep Ooh. driving. About another hour, I look over at him. He hadn't said a word. He looks terrible. And I said, Dick, you want me to pull over? He goes, keep Ooh. driving, kid. So we get up to the Red River, separates Texas and Oklahoma. And right before the Red River, I said, I said, Dick, you want me to pull over? He goes, drive across the river, kid. So I drive yeah. over the river. He goes, pull over. I pulled over. He got up, threw up all over Oklahoma. And he got back Did in the he? truck and he said, ah, don't ever throw up in Texas, kid. Is that what he said? <laughs> That's a shoot too, ain't it? Oh, my God. I'm sitting there thinking everything I've ever wanted you to be, you are. Oh, you crushed. Yeah, you nailed it. That is Dick Murdoch. I don't got to tell you about, remember that place you used to go to by the was it the Shreveport Airport, like a Hilton buffet, Jerry, or something? Yeah. Hell, Asian food. Yeah, kick, kick, kick a poo or whatever it was, kick a poo in. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and then the, the other thing about Dick was we'd go to Gillies. Gillies. Yeah, yeah Gillies, yeah. yeah. And we got in a fight. It was uh, some uh, no. boys from uh they're actually from minnesota they were big tough strong dudes and that's another story but yeah i just yeah you guys definitely know dick murdoch oh my lord oh he was the best he, yeah he'd go to he you know he knew everybody so we'd go to bars together and he would never let me eat he never let me drink with him so i'd have to sit over by myself he'd go over and talk to his friends so one night we got in a fight with a bunch of fans and coming out of the ring and Dick, I guess I did okay because we go to the bar. He goes, all right, kid, you can drink with us. Just don't say anything. <laughs> so I, I, great. <laughs> that is so Murdoch. Yeah. That Whoa. is. Yeah, he, uh, I, uh, yeah, actually, I'm surprised, Bradshaw, because some guys never even meet Murdoch, do they? Uh -huh. And uh, uh, yeah. it's hard to talk about a guy that you haven't met, and it's hard to keep the other guy happy. But, but that's yeah, that's really cool. And then they bring you this Cajun town, a place called Plain Dealing, Louisiana. <laughs> now, you guys, if you've ever heard of Plain Dealing, Louisiana, <laughs> thirty miles in the woods from Bowser City, <laughs> uh, Shreveport, and and when. And you get there, it is like what you see on the Burt Reynolds White Lightning, Cajun, Cajun, <laughs> Cajun. It was uh, the height of uh, sinful people on top of that. <laughs> adulterous, adulterous people. Oh, my God. I, I think Murdoch knew ever, ever, ever. We hide out in the world like that too. It was I, unreal. I really <laughs> he knew everybody. He yeah, knew everybody, was, every yeah. town. It was unbelievable how many yeah. people he knew. You are so right. On. It, you just you do, you don't you don't meet a guy that knows that many people. You think yourself that we know a lot of people, but when a guy knows that many people, that was just fun to be part of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it right was. now it's just, you guys, thank you for so much for having me. You know, I could do this for six hours. So <laughs> don't well, be shy to cut me off. Uh, no, no. Thank you, John. We, we appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. So thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you in May 13th in St. Louis. May 13th, St. Louis. Don't forget about the con, the WrestleCon and the Ice House. And uh, more stories up ahead, you guys. I want to hear more about your lives and uh, how many uh, people you offended like I did. <laughs> well, I hope Herb Simmons has a bar that he can keep open all night. 
to keep up with these stories. <laughs> well, I mean this from my heart. You guys are everything I heard about and more. You guys are, I love you dudes. I mean that. Thank you. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Anytime you we'll try to get a part two come down.